All right, uh, beyond the JCR. That's gonna be the most interesting part of the whole presentation, I think. <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, where to start? Brief overview of what we're gonna talk about. Um, first, I'll introduce ShareCare, just perfunctory, because that's what you do. Uh, JCR, what is a JCR? You probably heard the word, but I'm sure not everybody here really is on the, the, the deep end of the pool of necessarily being into that. So we'll talk a little bit about what a JCR is. We'll talk a little bit about activation versus con custom content apps. If you were um, at the conference last year, I talked a lot about activation. So we'll talk about how that is different. Um, then we'll dig into the custom content apps themselves, um, the configuration and the code of them. Not gonna show code on the screen, gonna keep it a little bit light this year, but. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about what it takes to make a custom content app, some caveats to doing it, um, and then we'll talk about some use cases. So that's where we're going. All right, brief introduction. What is ShareCare? So ShareCare is um, an amalgam of Jeff Arnold, who was the guy who created WebMD, Dr. Oz, Oprah, Sony, Discovery. Um, basically, the story is that that Jeff Arnold and Dr. Oz and Oprah were sitting around one day talking, and Dr. Oz said, well, if you had WebMD to do all over again, what would you do differently? And it really boiled down to he thought WebMD was a little encyclopedic. It wasn't very um, engaging and human, and medical information really should be more about you personally than just a, a reference material. So that's what ShareCare was created to do, and that's what we've been doing. Um, who am I? I am Casey DeMint. I'm the chief architect for ShareCare. Uh, we've been doing that about four years now. Before that, I was chief architect for weather.com for about five years. Um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make websites work at various levels of scale and various types of um, uh, requirements and use cases. So, um, all right, that out of the way. Let's talk about a JCR. So JCR, Java Content Repository, um, is a specification that was created by Sun years ago um, as part of their community process. And what they were really trying to do is create a standard way to represent a, a bunch of content in a data store um, so that everyone could use that same standard. It's meant to be sort of analogous to what JDBC does for connecting to a relational database, the standard API for doing it. So JCR itself isn't actually an implementation, it's just the spec for how you talk to it. Um, almost all of the enterprise CMS applications out there have standardized on using a JCR. Um, it's just it was the thing Sun created as this is the way you should make a content repository and everybody did it. Um, logically, a JCR is kind of like an XML file. And if you've, you've worked inside of the configuration of Magnolia, you've probably noticed that it's, it feels a little bit like working with an XML file. You're building a giant tree. Every node contains other nodes. Those nodes can have properties or they can have additional nodes. And so it's, it's, it's that sort of a structure and actually part of the spec called for it to be able to, to exchange information directly with XML. That's why, unsurprisingly, your standard export and import formats are XML files. Um, benefits of the JCR is it's extremely flexible, right? It's, it's, it's this generic tree structure like an XML file that you can do anything you want with. You can put any sort of information you want. You don't have to go and define a new table structure if you wanna have a new kind of information in it. You just add no, more nodes in. Um, it's really simple to navigate, so you can walk down through the nodes very, very obviously, very intuitively. Um, querying is a little bit tricky because it is primarily a hierarchical data structure, right? It's a, you have a node, that node has children, that node has children, that node has children, and it's very much oriented around that notion of one thing being within another thing. So. When you get to a situation where you want to do cross-cutting concerns, like if I want to see every single node that has a property equal to this, at a traversal level of understanding of this tree, it's not really a very natural way to navigate around inside of that structure. And um, 
the JCRs itself, the implementations, don't typically have any sort of a notion of clustering or replication. So with a normal database, you would think of as like, okay, I'm going to have a write master and five read slaves so that if one of my read slaves goes away, I'm fine. And if the write master dies, I just promote one of the read slaves up to master. JCRs don't typically do this. And if you've used Magnolia much, you know that there's, there's an author instance and it has a copy of the JCR. And then there are pub instances and they have a copy of the JCR. And when you want to move data from one to the other, you, the application itself has to like tell the other version, here's some new data that I want you to put in your JCR. The JCR itself doesn't move the data around. Um, so JCRs, lovely thing, wonderful solution for certain classes of problems not necessarily a great solution for every kind of problem that you're going to run into. Um, so this provokes the question if you're using Magnolia, which is, I want to get the data out of the JCR. A lot of my content I don't want to have in that sort of a hierarchical structure. How do I get it out of the JCR and into a normal database where I can do other things with it, but still be able to create and modify and publish my, mag my pages in Magnolia with that content in it? Um, that's an area that I have spent a lot of the last four years fighting around with. Um, the way that we have been doing it up till this point, up until Magnolia 5.3, is with activation. Activation is a fairly straightforward thing. You're familiar with it. You make a change in Magnolia, you activate it, publish it out to the pubs. So what we have been doing up till now is that normal process, create the content in Magnolia, publish it out to the pubs, but when the activation actually occurs, have a custom handler in the pipeline that has been registered that catches that node on the fly as it's going through, reads the information out of it, writes that into the actual database as well in process of it going out onto the site. So in that way, anytime we activate content, it also gets put into the database. Fairly reasonable solution, has a couple advantages. Number one, you could do it forever. Uh, I think we started using Magnolia around 4.2, um, and you've been able to do it since at least then. I don't know when it got added in. I imagine it's been there for a long time. And it's one step, right? You, your content authors, they go in, they modify their content, they hit activate, it gets in the database too. They don't have to do extra work. Disadvantages. There's consistency problems here, right? Did your activation succeed? Did it actually get put into the database as well? Um, most of the time, yes, but sometimes you get some drift with the database and managing that problem is, is a little bit compli complicated. And the biggest disadvantage is that it means any kind of data that we're gonna manage in this way has to go one direction. It has to be ma managed on the author instance and then published out to the public instance. You can't have a situation where you're managing data in that way, but users are also able to modify it on the pub instance, and that's getting pushed back in and updating Magnolia. You probably could do that, but it's, it would be a lot more work. So really for this kind of data, it, it's a one direction type operation. So we are very excited about Magnolia 5, the changes that came in Magnolia 5, really that came in 5.3, and the reason is because it opens up another avenue for dealing with this problem, and that is the custom content app, specifically a custom content app built on top of an external database. So in this model, what's going to happen is your content authors are still in Magnolia. They're still using that same common interface that they are familiar with. They're not having to bounce around between different applications. But the data changes that they're making, the content mo modifications that they're making, are being stored directly in a database. It doesn't go to the JCR. It's not ever part of that model. It's immediately part of general persistent information across your entire website. So advantages here. Consistency is not a problem, right? I don't have to worry about is my JCR and my database in sync because there's only one copy of the data and it's always right. And it means we can go two ways. I could have a user management interface inside of Magnolia that allows people to go in and, and update somebody's address or update their email address for them. And at the same time, those users could modify their own records on the public website, and that information would also be available within the management interface inside of Magnolia. So it's, it's, a, it's a single life cycle of data. Your disadvantages is it's not one step anymore for doing page modifications. 
because if you wanted to make a page for a certain content element that you're building this way, building it in the app doesn't actually make a page definition for it. So you also have to go make a page. Um, updating it in the future updates the page too, but it's still, it's a little bit more work. And then at the moment, and though apparently that's going to change quite a bit in 5.4, but at the moment in 5.3, these are a little bit of a pain in the rear end to implement. Um, there's some, there's some details you have to deal with. Um, okay, so that's why I'm doing it. The next question. You've been hearing about custom content apps all day yesterday. You'll hear about them more today. Specifically in the case of a custom content app that's, that's attached to an external database, how is that different? You know, why, is, why, is, why is that in any way different from anything else that we're talking about? So to understand that, we need to talk a little bit about what a custom content app is. So the pieces that you see on the screen here, this notion of a custom content app, it has a browser, it has a detail, it has maybe additional sub apps too. You can also make a custom a content selector for it that has a selector field and a choose dialog. What you're looking at here on the screen is exactly the same for any kind of custom app. Doesn't matter whether it's JCR based, it's connecting out to S3, it's looking to, up to a database. This is pretty much a universal structure. Not all of this is required. You could make one that just had a browser and didn't have a detail or a detail, but, but most content apps are going to look like this when you boil them down to their, their underlying pieces. Um, and in this case, one that's based on a database is exactly the same. What's different is that everything that you see on the screen here, if you are building a custom content app against the JCR, can be done in configuration. You can go into the JCR itself, you can build out these structures, and you will have defined everything that is necessary for it to work. You don't have to write any code at all unless you consider an XML file code, which we could have that debate, but that's a different thing. So when we start talking about attaching it to a database, there are a few things you need to do that are not the same as if you were just building one on top of a JCR. Next few slides are gonna be a little bit content dense because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk through specifically what it is that you need to do in order to make one of these based on a database. I don't expect anybody to remember all of these details, but I wanna, I wanna sort of give you a feel for what the scope of creating one of these is. And also, if you actually wanted to do it, you can walk through these bullets and it will tell you exactly the pieces that you need to build in order to make one of these. Um, but in this case, I'm trying to explain them just in, in normal terms. So, at a configuration level, the things you need to do differently in the JCR when you're building one based on a database. Basically, it's six pieces that you need to create. You need to specify the implementation classes you've defined for your actions for deleting and, and updating your database. You need to go in and clear out the path. I'll talk about what that means when we actually show it. But, um, but basically the workbench by default, if you don't tell it anything, just assumes that the default is a slash. Um, in this case, you don't want that to be the case. You need to go into for each one of the views that you wanna show. And a view is in this case, things like a list view, a tree view, inside of your workbench. For each one of those, you need to make a class and specify that class in the configuration. And then you need to specify the class for your content connector. And the content connector is the thing that tells it how to talk to the database. In your detail, which is the form for editing a specific item, you again need to specify your action classes and you need to extend the content connector that you defined over in the browser. So from a configuration perspective inside the JCR, that's everything you need to do in order to attach one of these to an external database. At a code level, what you need to do is again, fairly straightforward. You need to make a container. And they talk a lot about content connectors, but really the container is the heart of the action. The container is the, is the thing that is wrapping up your connection to some external entity, be it a database or S3 or even the JCR. The container is the thing that holds the data. So you need to create a container to load and create your data. You need to make a connector. What the connector is doing is it's, 
it's translating addresses, right? It's like you give it a URL fragment, it gives you back the item. You give it an item, it gives you the URL fragment. Give it an ID, same way. Um, actions. So here's one of the tricks about it, is that on these containers and connectors, you'll see methods for modifying the data, but you don't actually, when you're dealing with an external data, do any of that in a connector and a container. Your actions are the things that actually go in and talk to your database and make changes to your database. Um, and then there's an event that they fire to go and refresh the view that you're gonna see. And then the presenter. So there's a definition for the presenter that tells it which class you've written to make a presenter, and the presenter itself, which ties that view back to the underlying container. And by presenters, again, what I'm talking about is the list view and the tree view stuff. It's, it's the, 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 the graph that you're looking at that shows you the individual pieces of data. Um, okay, so that's a custom content app. That's the thing that you actually go into to, to find and manipulate your data. The other piece that you can do in this is a content selector. And think of a content selector as being essentially a piece that you go and drop into somewhere else to access the thing that you've created. So for instance, um, if you wanted to, to have a field that you can put on a form anywhere to go and find one of the things that you've defined in your custom app, the content selector is the, is the thing you make to do that. Same thing for configuration. There are several changes you need to make. First thing is you've got to actually create a field type for that custom field that you want to make. So there's a place in configuration where you specify, hey, I've made a new field type. My field type is a user selector or a, a Q&A selector. Um, in the app, you would also have the ability to create a choose dialog. Choose dialog is just another way for the little list that you make in the browser, but you can make a customized version of that specific to a particular, um, a particular view for picking things if you wanted to. And then where you put it, all you end up doing is specifying the field definition cl class for the form that you're wanting to reference, specifying a, a custom column definition in display you want to see. That all sounds kind of confusing, but I'll show it to you in a few minutes, and it's, it's really very simple. Um, and then code for a content selector is, is pretty straightforward. You, you define the definition for the custom field you want to make. You make a factory for it. And what that factory is really doing is when you've picked a piece of data, it takes the value that you've selected, the object you've selected from the list, gets the ID of it, and then stores that ID in the field in your form. So it's, that, that's its job. Um, there's a formatter definition and a formatter. What that is is when you've used one of these, by default, what it's returning back is just an ID, you know, a GUID or something like that. So where you're showing this in a list, that's not very pretty. A formatter actually lets you render that inside of a list and make it attractive. So you have the ability to define that class. Um, and that's it. So if you wanted to make a custom content app tied to an external database, what you just saw on those last four slides, that's every piece you need to create to do it. And it actually amounts to not a whole lot of work. Um, it's kind of difficult to figure out where to drive the stake into the ground, but hammering the stake into the ground is not hard. Um, what is hard? Caveats. So I mentioned earlier that in 5.3, these are, there's a little bit of difficulty to this. Um, there are some specific roadblocks you're going to hit if you try to do this. First one is that there's still a bit of the JCR, the nature of the JCR, kind of hard-coded into how these apps are working. So specifically, there are, there are three places that I hit walls. The first one, and by far the most difficult thing to deal with, is that in your connector that you're, that you're creating, that's, that's translating back and forth between your objects and IDs for those objects, there is this notion of get default item ID. And all over the place, it's going to be calling in saying, hey, give me the default ID for items in this collection. Well, that makes sense in a, in a hierarchical world where there's a root, right? There's a base. And that's what that's supposed to point at. But when I'm dealing with records in a database, there's no hierarchy. There's no root. And so it's really tricky feeling, figuring out the right compromise of what to return for the default ID. I probably spent a week 
just fighting with that one method, trying to decide the right way to do it. For now, honestly, I think your best bet is if you do this, just have the default item ID be null. There's going to be a consequence to that. I'll show you what it is in a minute, um, but it's probably the most livable of the compromises, uh, your options. Second one. This one's only going to bite you if you want to make a content selector. So if you go to make a content selector, what's going to happen is it's going to take your, your list view that you've created for your workbench, and it's going to wrap it in a field so that it can stick it in a form for doing the selection. When it wraps it in the field, there's this workbench field dot init content method that gets called that is hard coded to tree view. It is going to set the view to tree view. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, you know, you're working with a database. It's not a tree. So you probably didn't make a tree view like I didn't make a tree view. When you get to this step, if you don't have a tree view, it's going to throw a null, po null pointer exception and blow up. It just won't open the content selector at all. So if you want to make a content selector, you have to make a tree view. Even if there's no tree at all, and I'll show you this in a minute. So I've got a tree view, but there's no actual tree, but you have to make a tree view. Um, the last one is actually more of a documentation issue than an actual code issue. When you throw that event to say, hey, I changed an element, go update the list. If you read the documentation, it says, if you've deleted an item, return the ID of the parent node of this item. Uh, if you're dealing with a, hierarch with a hierarchically list data structure like a database, there's no parent ID for you to throw. Turns out you can actually ignore that one. Throwing back the ID of the item that got deleted works just fine. It'll do exactly what you want it to do. Um, okay, so that's the hierarchy stuff. The other piece that's going to be a little bit tricky is, and I, again, I'll show you this in a second. When you make a content selector, you have the ability to, to pick the piece of content from the other item that you want to use. That's going to return back an ID, and the ID is what's going to get stored in your content. Um, when you get to your page and you want to render it, what you have is the ID. There is not a mechanism for saying, hey, give me the actual object that that pointed at. So um, there is apparently a way around this. Jan was telling me yesterday that internally they've started actually cheating and using the dam because the dam has gotten around this problem. So you can use it even if you're not using assets. You can just put normal database objects in it too. Um, I haven't tried that yet, so I, uh, I will merely throw that out as a possibility. But for right now, the way that I'm working with it, I just have a, an alternate manual mechanism for getting the object. So I get the ID and I make a tag lib so that I can give it the ID and get back the actual object from the database. Um, not hard, but it's just an extra step you have to deal with. And then the last one that I've bumped into is separate containers for the sub apps. So let me flip back real quick. So you've got a browser, which is where you're looking at a list of your content elements. You've got a detail where you're editing a specific content element. Each of these individually has a separate instance of the container. They don't share a common container in their basic operation. What that means is that if you go to create a new object, you're going to have to create the new object in the list, and then it's going to try to open that object to edit it in the detail. So you've actually got to store the object out into persistence, even though it's got nothing but an ID on it at the time because it hasn't actually gone to the form to get edited. It's a little bit of a pain in the rear end, but that's, that's the basic operation because they, they are separate data structures. Now again, Jan tells me that there is a way to actually create a single instance of the container bound to the app and get it injected into both so that they share it. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. When I figure out how to do it, I will update the source code for this so that you also have access to that. But for now, bear, bear in mind that the, con the containers are by default different. So you have to deal with that and you have to actually store the object. Okay, that's a lot of information. It's a whole lot of information. Um, again, I don't expect anybody to remember that. What I really hope is that if you try to create one of these, what you will be able to do is go back to these slides and just walk through those four pages of that slide and it will tell you step by step exactly what you need to write in order to make one of these. Um, that plus the source code, honestly, you can probably sit down and figure out how to do this in about a day and a half. Um, 
pretty straightforward. Um, all right, now what do we do with it? So here's what we're planning to do with it at ShareCare. First is simplifying and unifying the content management, right? So we have got some data that's in a database. We've got some data that's in Magnolia JCR. This will let us get to a point where we can have a single place where content managers go to update the information. Because right now, sometimes they go to Magnolia, sometimes they go to custom CMS interfaces that we've built into the application. So getting this simplified down to you go to Magnolia to update the content regardless of where the content's actually stored is going to simplify the actual operation of the system for the content managers. Um, second one is these tools make it really easy once you've got the, the infrastructure in place to just drop out new interfaces. So if you want to go make a new CMS interface for another kind of data, it's literally just a matter of you spend 20 minutes wiring up the configuration, hit publish, and now you have dropped out a new CMS interface into your application. That's way easier than going in and having to custom write that in, in the Java application. So we expect that this will greatly enhance our ability to build interfaces for content managers to be able to make changes to the system. Um, second use case is getting data from external content sources into Magnolia templates. So we've got a lot of pages where some of the data showing on the page is from Magnolia and some of the data on the page is from a database. Right now, pretty much all of that data that's coming from a database we've had to go manually write code to be able to access that on that specific page. This tool will mean that we can now build content selectors, put them into the configuration of those particular pages, and now it becomes very easy for us to go grab data from these external sources and get them into our pages. Um, so that's going to simplify a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, with the caveat that you have to dereference it manually right now. What I was talking about before, if you, you get the ID on the page, but you don't actually get the content element itself. So I'll have to do a little bit more work, but that's reasonably generic enough that we can make that without having to have to go get new code every time, or go write new code every time. And then the trick, the DAM, DAM V2. So I will confess, as I was working through learning how to build these content apps, at several points I had the thought, it's like, why do you need the digital asset management system, right? The, 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 the content app can do whatever sort of linking out to external assets you want to do. Well, it turns out Magnolia had the same idea because all the content that the digital asset management app is is a fully built working version of exactly what I'm talking about with a generic placeholder for the actual implementation of go to this external data source and get these assets. So if what you're trying to build is one of these custom content apps, but you want to deal with external assets and you're not necessarily talking about a database, you're talking about like images, you can trim all of this down to you implement one select or provider class and you're done. And you don't have to do any of the other stuff that I'm talking about. Not sure if that's true if you're not dealing with assets. Like I said, Jan has suggested you can also do it with things that aren't assets, but definitely if what you're dealing with are assets, Everything I just talked about simplifies down to you implement one class and wire that into the configuration and then you're done. DAM makes it really, really easy to do this for that kind of information. Okay, so last thing before I show it actually working. More information, right? So all of what I'm about to show you is in GitHub. Um, there's a one repo for the actual application another repo for the app that, I, that I've built within the application. These are all open source, they're out there. Feel free to pull them down and use them within your code um, or as inspiration for your code, it's, it's all there. Um, if you have questions, don't do what I did, which is got stubborn and said, I'm not going to call Jan, I'm not gonna ask for help, I'm gonna figure this out all on my own. Um, that was hard, really hard. Um, don't do it, if you get stuck, Send me an email, hit me on LinkedIn, I will be happy to help. Um, most of this stuff is pretty simple. It's just a matter of, like I said, figuring out where you need to go hammer the stake into the ground. Um, all right, so without further ado, let's actually 
do some of this. Let's see if I can get this up onto that screen. Oh, I know what I need to do to do this. Drop it down there. Bring it over there. Make it big. All right. And just for kicks, so I can prove that I'm not pretending, we will bring the database over too. All right, so what you'll notice here is you've got your standard pages and then you've got a couple additional apps that I've created, categories and articles. These will be very simple and we'll start with the really simple one, categories. So I've just made some categories. What you're looking at right now, several times you heard me talk about the browser. This is the browser. So this is the thing that gives you your list. You'll note in this list, I've got a list and I've got a tree. This is what I was talking about, about if you want to use the selector, you've got to make a tree. So I've got a tree, but the tree is just a list with no children. Doesn't hurt anything, but it's a, it offends my sense of moral propriety that it has to be there. Um, so this is the browser list. When you click on one of these, you open up the detail, which is the form for editing it. Um, What's going on here is, as I said before, there's an underlying container talking to the database. There's a connector that it's using to translate back and forth between um, these ideas, IDs down here and the actual item that, that Magnolia can understand. Um, and so what you're looking at is in Magnolia, but it's on the database. And I can actually show you this in the database. These are the categories that you're looking at. And these are those categories in the database. And if I come in here and I change one of these, uh, this is awesome fitness. Save it. You see this is updated here. It's now awesome fitness there. And if I update the query in the database, it's awesome fitness in the database too. So I'm not dealing with the JCR at all. This is directly an interface for my database. So this that you're looking at here is essentially the custom content app. So now let's talk about the selector. The content selector, another app I've made, this is for articles. Articles have categories. So you see these are linked in over here. When I go into one of these, you'll see that category has select new. So this is the when I talked about you have to make, define a field type for your content selector, this is the field type that I created. I said I want a, con a category selector field. Um, when I click select, this in turn goes and update and opens exactly the same list that you were looking at before. So this, is, this isn't just similar to the thing, it's actually using the exact same browser that was defined in the other case. Doesn't have to. Um, you can make a trim down version if you wanted to, but in my case, I'm just using the same exact browser in both places. This is the place where you have to make the tree. You notice when this came up, by default, the tree was selected. That's hard coded. It's always going to be a tree. Um, but it doesn't really affect anything. You can get the ex essentially the same information. You just get a little triangle in front of it or the other side. So when you pick one of these, where is the rest of my form? Sorry, the view is too small and the selector has gone off the bottom. So we'll cheat because this doesn't scroll for some reason. There. So we'll pick this guy. We'll say this is now awesome fitness. And you see, ah, fresh. Oh, the name is still fitness. Never mind. Well, I don't like that. I want the name to be awesome fitness too. So now I come back over here to category. You should be awesome fitness. Nah. 
And you see this is immediately refreshed. It now says awesome fitness in the category. So this is all linked together, works very well. Um, the caveats. I mentioned the default ID issue. Where that default ID is going to bite you is, you see we've got a nice lovely little, little area over here that has the actions you can do. And as long as one of these is selected, that's fine. But if I unselect, where no item is selected, because there's no default ID item for it to bind to, it no longer knows it's dealing with articles, and this goes away. Doesn't really hurt anything, except you wouldn't want to open this if there wasn't at least one item in there, because you wouldn't get any actions to be able to add a new one. Um, so that's that caveat of the fact that it still expects this to be a tree. Um, when I showed this to Jan yesterday, he had all sorts of ideas going in his head for how to fix it. So I don't think it'll be like that for long, but, but right now that's what you would have to deal with. Um, the other thing, oh, I didn't mention this before. One thing I haven't figured out how to do, but which is apparently very doable. So you notice this still shows the ID right there. There's apparently a formatter that you, class that you can define for making that also show the pretty view. I haven't figured that one out yet. I will figure it out, I'll get it into the source code so it'll be available for you too. Um, but, okay, so that's that part of it. Now, let me show you the trick of selecting the content. So, I've got pages here, and you'll note that in my pages I have not defined individual pages for individual articles. I've just made a general article page, a general category page. And the reason for that is these aren't defined in the JCR. They're defined in an external database. So when you go and look at an individual category page, it's templated out for an individual category, but the category isn't coming from this definition. When you actually view the page itself, no, not you. You. So when I go and look at articles, and I select one of these. So this is all being filled in from the database. Now, this is the piece that I was talking about, about you have to resolve this yourself. Because, well, so you see in this case right here that I've got, I've referenced Awesome Fitness. So you see Awesome Fitness on the page. The trick is that in my content, what I selected was this ID. So when you get to the page when you've done this, what's actually happening in this page is it's getting their content object that gets passed by Magnolia into the page definition. That content object has this value. It doesn't actually have the category object. So you've then got to go and resolve the category object. In my case, all I've done is I built a little tag lib that knows how to query my database given a certain ID. I stuck that into the JSP of this page and it goes and fetches that category object and then uses it to render the, the name and the link. Um, it's not hard, sort of stuff you do in, J in web pages all the time. It's just, if it would actually give you the object, it'd make your life a little bit easier. Um, and that's pretty much all of it working. Um, you can also select items themselves I'm not actually using this, but I'll show you that in the same way that you can put those forms into the detail, you can also come in here and add a selector to directly pick an article in there. So this is when I was saying this is going to make it really easy for us to access external content. This is exactly where we're going to use it. We're going to build components that, um, that are referencing external data, and then you can just, when the content editor is working on the page, they can go in, directly pick the data that they want out of the database to show in a certain component on a page, done. Um, so this is, in particular, going to make our lives much, much easier. Um, okay, that is basically all of it. Um, which leaves us here. Mm -hmm.